Well, we'll come to the time in our service now where we'll look at a passage of Scripture. We'll talk about what it means, what's going on, why it matters, and, and how it matters to our lives today. So if you have a Bible with you, if you will turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7, beginning at verse 57. It's on page 776 if you're using the Brown Pew Bible. And when you found that, would you stand together with me? Acts chapter 7, beginning at verse 57. Just to catch you up uh, as you're finding it, what's been happening here is Stephen, who is uh, one of the very first deacons of the early church, uh, he has been having some conversations and debates with some other uh, devout Jews uh, within Jerusalem. And unfortunately, uh, Stephen is so full of the Spirit, so wise, that he continues to just shut down these guys every time he talks with them. But rather than continuing to try to uh, best him and help convince him that Jesus is not who he says he was, these uh, guys decide to basically put false blasphemy charges against him. They come to the religious leaders and say, Stephen has been speaking against the temple and against Moses. And Stephen is dragged into religious court, if you will. He's brought before the religious leaders in order to give an account. And Stephen breaks into a, a, a speech, a, a long speech, basically going through the entire history of Israel, showing how every time God sends his prophets to the people, they continue to resist, they continue to kill, and he ends this wonderful speech by saying, and you guys are the exact same. It's just the same with you. God sent his own greatest prophet, that Jesus, the Messiah, and you killed him too, and you resist him just like you always did. Scriptures tell us that as he was giving this message to the religious leaders, giving his testimony, his face shone like an angel. But they are so enraged by what they hear they are losing it on him. They're freaking out. And then as he's giving this speech, he sees a vision. Heaven is opened. And he sees Jesus standing beside the throne in heaven. And he tells them this. And then we read this now in verse 57. At this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of this city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned him deeply. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Now the remainder of chapter 8 tells us now a story of what happened as people were scattered. If you see verse 4 there, it says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So the church is scattered, but it's not just scattered for no purpose. They're now preaching the word wherever they go. We're kind of pick up the story again now in chapter 9. Follow with me there. Chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, this was what Christianity was called before it was called Christianity, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up for the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus, and for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Verse 10, in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias has come to the place, and has come to place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man 
and all the harm that he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. He's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call in your name. The Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me to you so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is God's word. You may be seated. Wow. Let me uh, pray for us. Ask God to bless now uh, this time as we come to his word. Oh Lord God, we ask you by your spirit to come now and open our eyes and ears to receive what you want to accomplish in us through your word. We believe that your spirit inspired this word to be written. And though it spoke to its original readers, it also speaks to us today. So God, would you give us an openness to receive what that is? Would we be changed by it, Father? Accomplish that purpose in us, I ask, and as I always pray, O oh Lord God, eternal Father, move and govern my tongue to speak your truth now. Amen. August 4th, 1944, quote, It was around 10.30, I was upstairs with the Van Pelses in Peter's room, and I was helping him with his schoolwork. Suddenly, someone came running up the stairs, and the door opened, and a man was standing right in front of us with a gun in his hand, and it was pointed at us. Downstairs, everyone was gathered. My wife, the children, and the Van Pelses all stood there with their hands up, end quote. This is the chilling testimony of Otto Frank on the day that he and his family were discovered and arrested, hiding in their secret annex behind the bookcase in this home in Nazi-occupied Amsterdam. Otto Frank is, of course, the father of Anne Frank, whose diary we still read today, the diary she wrote for two years as her family was hidden in this secret annex. It's been now made into numerous uh, films, documentaries, and plays. If you've ever read that diary or seen the films, one of the first things you pick up on is is the rapidly shifting political climate happening in Europe uh, that brings about, uh, in 1940, the capture of Amsterdam and leads to eventually Anne and her Frank having to go into hiding. Uh, Her family have to go into hiding because of the increasing pressures and stress on all of them. Something else which you would absolutely see throughout is just the overwhelming stress and pressure, the daily terror of knowing that you're being hunted. Something savage, isn't there? Even animalistic about people hunting other people. And I think we rightly characterize the Nazi efforts to to cleanse Europe of the Jews as, as inhumane, as animalistic and beastly. Well, we conclude this series this morning, as Les was saying, we conclude this series that we've entitled True Family Portrait, where we've spent the last five weeks looking at some of the most notorious uh, sinners and outlaws in the Bible who all happen to be very much still a part of the family of God. And there were two purposes that we had for doing that. The first one was just to help us shed and get rid of that, that cleaned up Uh, a photoshopped vision that we often have of what the family of God looks like and show us a a biblical picture of what it actually looks like. The hope there is just to keep us from trying to hold up that kind of false image ourselves, whether as a church or as individuals. We are all a people in need, and we ought to demonstrate that. We still continue to be a people in need. The other purpose was to show in every case God's unhindered and powerful ability to transform and use even the most unlikely and unexpected of people in his kingdom. And I hope that that's been a great encouragement to you in your own life if you've seen God's ability to use misfits and outlaws just like you and I. We're going to need to keep those two purposes very much in our minds now this morning as we come to this last true life portrait because 
Although each of the people we've looked at through the weeks probably uh, only called for maybe a measured questioning as to how they could be included in the family of God, when it comes to a man like Saul of Tarsus, there would appear to be no questioning required. I mean, obviously, he, he couldn't be a part of the family of God, right? I mean, the, the, this, this Saul of Tarsus that we're looking at, he wasn't just some anti-Christian intellect like Richard Dawkins who just thinks Christians are stupid. Saul was a, a persecutor of God's church. He was a hunter of men and women belonging to the way, And I know this is a stark image and it's probably very offensive to some people, but I don't think it would be inappropriate at all to see in our passage here Saul dressed in a full Gestapo uniform, bringing a band of foot soldiers with him through the night in order to stamp out and snuff out this flickering flame, these people belonging to this way and this heretical faction. It's absolutely what he's doing. The pre-conversion picture of the Apostle Paul that Luke gives us here is, is terrifying. It could not be more terrifying. And yet in light of that, it also couldn't be a more perfect way to end this series as we see the overwhelming power of the gospel to transform even the chief of sinners. So, the way we're going to do that this morning, the way I want to look at our passage is in three ways. I want us to look at the enemy of the state, inside out, and then finally, my brother's keeper. The enemy of the state, inside out, my brother's keeper. So if you closed your Bibles, would you open them again to Acts chapter 7? We'll dig into this together. So let's begin by looking at the enemy of the state. The enemy of the state. If you look at uh, verse 58 of chapter 7 there where we started reading, it's almost cinematic the way that Luke introduces Saul. I mean, we're right in the middle of this horrific scene where uh, Stephen has been uh, giving his account before the religious leaders. He's dragged out into outside the city to be stoned. And if you think about it, it really is a, a sickening, disturbing detail to say everyone was laying their cloaks at Saul's feet because we know the reason they're doing it. They're laying their cloaks at his feet so they can be less encumbered as they hurl stones at Stephen until he dies. But yet, the comment is also so parenthetical that if we didn't know the rest of the story, we'd often wonder why did he even mention it. So before the picture and the little flickering uh, mention of Saul disappears, Luke mentions him again at the end of this paragraph here, telling us a little more, that much more than a coat holder, Saul was really an overseer of this execution. He was the one presiding over it and giving his approval of Stephen's death. And whether you want to call it the straw that broke the camel's back or the first punch thrown in a fight, whatever it is, we see that because of this event, because of the stoning of Stephen, now in chapter 8, a great persecution breaks out now against the church and the people are scattered throughout the countryside now. It's almost as though this event has so emboldened Saul and religious leaders that they're just whipped into this fanatical frenzy now where they want to see all of the followers of Jesus treated with the same violence. As we said, it's because of this persecution. The church is now scattered throughout Judea, scattered throughout Samaria, and that sounds like a bad thing, and it is. But if you know at the beginning of the book of Acts, when Jesus is about to be uh, taken up into heaven, he actually tells them these are the very places that they're supposed to go to. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and all Samaria. They just... They just haven't gone yet. So if you look at verse 3 now with me here, we see, okay, Saul, he's very much the one leading this charge against Jesus' followers. He's ruthlessly dragging men and women out of their very homes, throwing them into prison. The NIV states here that Saul was seeking to destroy the church. Uh, Some of your translations will say beginning to ravage the church, Uh, 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 The word in Greek is actually a very strong expression that is used to describe wild animals tearing raw flesh. That's that's the word that they use to describe what Paul is doing to the church right now. 
And actually, one commentator says that Paul, or Saul here, he so much embodies the persecution, it's so much a part of who he is, that the church is actually described as experiencing peace upon his conversion. Chapter 9, verse 31, it says basically, yeah, when, when God saved him, everybody just took a big breath. Okay. That's, that's how much he was the one driving this persecution. And yet, we see, as is always the case, Satan's efforts and his forces that appear to be tearing apart Jesus' church, that appear to be damaging his people, only serve to bring about God's intended ends. Jesus had told his disciples to go and be witnesses in Judea and Samaria. And now, although it probably wasn't the way that they had wanted it to come about, that's what they're doing now. Remember, chapter 8, verse 4, they're now sharing the gospel in these places as they go. So they're doing what it was that Jesus had first commanded them to do. But in order to help us be grown by what we read here, I want you to take a moment and just imagine yourself in this early church scenario. Imagine what this would be like for you to be in the shoes of this persecuted church. Imagine what it would like to, to have to flee your homes or to have to go into hiding like Anne Frank and her family simply because of your following Jesus. What would it be like to know that there was a man like Saul hunting you like an animal everywhere you went, and at any moment you could be arrested and possibly killed? How would you be feeling about this man Saul? Terrifying figure. And then beyond that, how might you be feeling about Jesus and his church in the midst of these circumstances? Now, most of us in North America, we don't, we don't have any concept of what this would be like to experience persecution like this for our faith, to be hunted and despised just because we confess Jesus. But I wonder if even in this context where, where that kind of persecution was more prevalent, if the believers in the early church didn't just have massive questions and doubts now about God's ability to protect them, to sustain them. I mean, they've already experienced the, the persecution and the scorn of their devout Jewish family members, synagogue leaders, just because they're, they're following Jesus. Why wasn't God protecting them now? Why, why was he allowing all these terrible things to happen to Stephen and to his church? And the lesson in those very real questions that likely all of us either have asked or will ask at some point in our lives is that because we've read the rest of this story, we need to be very careful. Be very careful about judging the love of God or His care for us simply by looking at the external circumstances alone. I mean, think about it. Uh, God doesn't even give the church any kind of a heads up. Say, hey, guys, don't worry about it. I know this is going to be hard, but I'm going to bring you through this. He doesn't say anything to them. He just allows it to happen. But... We see God is accomplishing all kinds of things through this, through these circumstances, terrible as they are, in the life of his church as well as in Saul. But if you just looked at the bare facts, you would never know that. It's a grace to us that we can continue to read right now and see God is accomplishing his perfect will here. He's bringing about exactly what he wants. And at no point in time has he ever lost his sovereign control over what's happening. So just as we said last week, the Christian life is, in part, a submission to the belief that where God's word has spoken, he knows better than we do. And it's also a submission and a trust that where he is silent, that he is still for us. We need to have a firm grasp on those things. We need to believe that before difficulty comes, or we're never going to be able to endure the difficulty when it does come if we don't know, hey, he's still in control and he still knows what he's doing. It's one of the first things we see. So that's our introduction to Saul as the enemy of the state. Next, Luke is going to give us this amazing peek behind the curtain, really, into the providence of God through the life of Saul. So let's look now at Inside Out. Inside Out. We're going to jump ahead to chapter 9 now. Look with me here. We see in the first two verses, it shows that Saul has not slowed at all in his ravaging pursuit of the church. In fact, 
Now that he feels like he's pretty much cleaned up in Jerusalem, he asks for papers from the chief priest so that he can go to Damascus and do the same thing there. But now, in verse 3, look here, we see that somewhere along this 242-kilometer hike to Damascus, it's basically the distance from here to Kelowna as the crow flies, we see that God has very clearly placed a, a boundary marker on Saul's life, and he said, you're not going to go any further past this. And in a converting act, unparalleled anywhere else in the New Testament, the resurrected Jesus appears in a blinding flash of light to Saul, knocking him to the ground. You notice Jesus' words there when he talks to Saul. It's very interesting. I think verse 4, look there. When Jesus speaks to Saul, what does he say? Does he say, why are you persecuting my church? Why are you harming my followers? Now, what does he say? Verse 4, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Now, Saul is clearly uh, blown away by this event. He's gobsmacked in this moment. You see in verse 5, he basically asks, what do you mean me? Who's me? Me who? Jesus says, look at the end of verse 5, he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So so what's so incredible to see right away here is that Jesus Christ so intimately identifies with his church and with his kids that he can say to Saul, when you are persecuting my church, when you are persecuting my family members, you're actually persecuting me. That's good news for us today, to know that whatever we face, Jesus so identifies with us that to persecute us is to persecute him. We see that actually a corollary all through the Bible in Psalm 51 when David writes his his impassioned repentance to God for his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. Remember he says, against you alone have I sinned. That can only be true if this is true. To sin against God's children is to sin against him. Or Matthew's gospel, Matthew 25. Remember Jesus says that those who visited those in prison those who clothed the naked and fed the hungry, as much as you did it to them, you did it unto me, Jesus says. It's a direct correlation. We are so intimately tied with our Savior. To harm us is to harm him. Now, there's another odd thing that Luke uh, chucks into this passage here, a seemingly another insignificant detail in verse 7. Look here. Every time this event of Saul's conversion is recounted, here and elsewhere, we always hear that Saul's traveling companions heard the same thing. They didn't see the resurrected Jesus, but they heard his voice. They heard the words that he said. Now, why would he even bring that up? Who cares? Well, remember, uh, the author of uh, the book of Acts, as well as Luke, is Luke, who happens to be a doctor. And although he's compiling this information uh, uh, both for uh, theological as well as philosophical point of view, he's also compiling it as a doctor, as a, as a forensic expert seeking to gather evidence. And Luke knows, guy who's been on a six-day hike through the desert, what's somebody going to say when that guy gets to the next town and says, you know what, I saw a vision on the sixth day, I saw that great light and I talked to Jesus, everyone's going to be like, yeah, sure you did, sure you did. It's called sunstroke. And so he wants to say, hey, listen, it's not, it's not just Saul who had this moment happen. Everybody around heard the same thing. It's, it's corroborating evidence. They all heard the same thing. He wasn't having a hallucination. And then Jesus, after this event, he tells Saul, okay, get up. Go to Damascus. I'll tell you what you can do there. But now we see when Saul goes to get up, he's completely blind. <laughs> he has to be led by the hand now into Damascus. And imagine how humiliating that must have been for him. Here's the great feared Saul of Tarsus coming to ravage the church, now basically like showing up in a handy dart like a 90-year-old guy with a walker. It's not the picture that he was hoping to show up with. I mean, literally, it's like a a Cinderella hoping she's going to show up in her great carriage, but she forgets that it's daylight savings that night, and, and so instead she shows up with a pumpkin. It's not the way he hoped to come in. It certainly doesn't have the same effect. But what's interesting about Saul's blindness, as uh, commentator Bruce Milne points out so well, remember two weeks ago when we looked at Nebuchadnezzar and how uh, 
when God had led him as judgment out into the wilderness, he lost his mind. He began to take on animalistic uh, characteristics that mirrored the animalistic pride inside of him. Now, here we see with Saul's physical condition, his blindness, it is humiliatingly epitomizing the spiritual blindness, the spiritual darkness that he also has inside him. Literally, Saul has been now turned inside out so that his spiritual condition inside is now his external physical condition as well. But God doesn't just turn Saul inside out, he also turns him upside down. Because think about it, Saul had devoted his life now to persecuting this liar, this fake false messiah Jesus, and stamping out this heretical cult only to meet this same Jesus who he was, he's been told was a crucified fake. Now he meets him face to face on this road and he sees just how truly blind he's been all along. If you look at the end of verse 9 here, we see he's so devastated by this encounter as well as its implications. He can't even eat or drink anything for three days. What do you do do with that when you realize everything you've committed to your life to is wrong? Now Saul, who is later called Paul, he recounts the story of his conversion uh, numerous different times in Acts as well as in a number of the books that he authored himself. And what's also interesting to see is that when he recounts this same act of his conversion in Acts 26, he includes a little bit more detailed account of what Jesus says to him here on the road. I'm going to just read it for you. Along with the same words, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus says something else to him. He says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, what are goads and why does that even matter? Well, I want to point this out. This is important because many times when we look at Saul's conversion, we hold it up as this dramatic, instantaneous conversion. Bam! Look, Jesus changes him in a moment. Now, certainly it was dramatic. I think we've seen that that's true. But I want to ask you to consider that perhaps it wasn't as instantaneous as it appears at first. Because you see, a goad is, a, is like a sharpened stick, a, a long pole. Sometimes it's, it's the tool of a shepherd as well as a plowman used to direct an animal in the way that you wanted it to go. If it started to go off the road, it would strike the sharp point of the goad and go back on. Or Shepherds had it on the end of their staff and they would use it to direct a stubborn animal to continue to go the direction it was intended to go. And theoretically, if it hits the goad, it's going to not make the same mistake again. But you see, as uh, pastor and author Tim Keller points out so well, in using this expression and rebuking Saul, Jesus is showing us, he's, he's revealing to us that he's actually been leading Saul to himself for quite some time now. This is not Saul's first encounter with Jesus. If you think about uh, all that Saul has heard about Jesus up, and now, up until now from his peers, these things that he said are false, but he's been hearing about Jesus. He sees Stephen's uh, testimony as well as his martyrdom. And we know that the Spirit of God has also been pressing on him and pursuing him all this time. Saul has simply been kicking back against the goads all this time, against the good shepherd as he seeks to lead him until this final moment when he is finally brought into the right path. And I point that out because even as some of us have shared this morning, there may be somebody in your life right now that you've been praying for for years. Maybe they are disinterested in the gospel or completely hostile to it, and maybe you're at the place now where you've pretty much given up. You wonder, what's the point of praying anymore? What's the point of continuing to try to tell them about Jesus? Nothing's happening. There's no point anymore. And I can tell you the point of continuing to do that. I'll tell you in three words. Saul of Tarsus. That's the point. God was able to transform the church's most fierce persecutor into its greatest missionary a murderer and a blasphemer into the author of almost half of the New Testament. If he could do that and do it in a way that was completely uh, uh, shut off and, and unobservable to anyone else, and yet he was doing it all this time, it stands to reason that he may be doing the exact same thing in the life of that person 
that you've been praying for, even if right now you see no evidence whatsoever that he's doing it. Bottom line is don't stop praying. Don't give up hoping. God's boundary marker for that person may be just around the next corner. All right, we've seen Saul as the enemy of the state. We've looked at how God turned Saul inside out as well as upside down. The last thing I want us to see this morning has particular relevance to us as a whole church family. We'll look now at my brother's keeper. My brother's keeper. Now, in using that term, I'm referring uh, back to a story in Genesis 4 where the oldest son of Adam and Eve, Cain, he's killed his brother. God comes to Cain and, and rhetorically asks him, where's your brother? And Cain replies, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer to that question is, yeah, you are. And I'm sort of just co-opting that now and using it to describe what I think is a call to care for our brothers and sisters that God puts on every single one of his family members. Now, there's a lot of really weird, crazy, just jacked up things that God asks his people to do all through the Bible. Uh, uh, There's a place in the New Testament where Jesus asks his followers to, I want you to feed these uh, 5,000 men and women who have gathered here to hear me preach. Feed them, would you? There's another place uh, in Isaiah where, where God calls the prophet there to walk around Israel for three years with no pants on in order to demonstrate to them their spiritual condition as well as the coming humiliations when they're finally taken into captivity. But I would say ranking right up near the top 10 of these kind of Crazy things has got to be what we see now in the remainder of the book of Acts. Because God now calls someone who's already part of his family, this guy Ananias, to go to where Saul is staying right now and go to his house and pray for him to be healed. To which Stephen, or Stephen to which Ananias rightly responds, Huh? I'm sorry? You see, he's trying to even tell Jesus in case he's forgotten. You mean the same Saul that's here to arrest us? You'd like me to just go over and pray for him right now? Yeah, yeah, that sounds great, Jesus, sure. I'll be right there. But you see, God has a plan of what he's doing here. Look at verses 15 and 16 here. God says to him, go. This man... This guy that you're so afraid to go see, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. God has a a plan here. He's had a plan that he's been working out all along to reach the Gentiles as well as his own people with the message of the gospel. And his plan is to use this man, Saul, which nobody else would have ever chosen, as his chosen instrument to carry that out. That's not going to be easy. You see there in verse 16, he says, I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name. And what's amazing is Ananias is now an example of what we just said, of trusting obedience. He goes and does it. He trusts God's word, even when outward appearances and his own logic tell him that God is wrong. He still obeys and does what God calls him to do. And then in verse 17, look what happens. Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul. Now stop and think about that for a minute. What would that be like? Walking the entire way to Saul's house, thinking you're basically walking into a knife point, and then to come and put your hands on this feared, despicable man who has killed your brothers and sisters, put them in prison to put your hands on this guy and call him brother. Brother Saul. How incomprehensible would those words have been even hours earlier? To give us a modern picture of what that would feel like, this would be like one of those ISIS soldiers who stood on the beach and decapitated Coptic Christians. One of those guys hating Jesus and zealous in their uh, wanting to defeat and despise everything about the church and Jesus, one of those guys being converted to faith in Jesus and then sitting right here in one of the pews on Sunday morning, coming to your home group, asking you to, would you pray for me? I've encountered Jesus. 
Would you come and pray for me right now? What would that feel like? Would you welcome him? Actually, for the next few years, if you know in Paul's life, he experiences that exact same kind of a <laughs> feeling because he, he's known, he's so known by everyone as this guy that hated the church, that persecuted the church, that now every time he goes into a church or, or comes into someone's house, everyone's looking for the exits and you know, ladies have got their hands on their pepper spray just waiting for something to happen. They've heard, okay, yeah, I've heard something's happened, but they're just, nobody quite believes it yet because it's so unbelievable. But the means of Saul's healing, as well as his receiving of the Holy Spirit, is God's call to a man, Ananias, to welcome in Saul into the family, not as a probationary member, but as a full brother. And then we see in the rest of our passage, 17 to 19, Saul is healed. He receives the Holy Spirit. He's baptized and now begins a whole new life as a servant of the risen Jesus an unbelievable family portrait we look at this and we think wow that is amazing that God could save someone like Saul and bring him into the family that that's got to be the the greatest transformation in history and then we probably want to add to that man how unbelievable how unimaginable that he would ask Ananias to perform this task going and praying and welcoming Saul into God's family how how unbelievable that he would do that But I want to ask you to stop, even as you're thinking those thoughts, and ask yourself, when you think about the unworthiness of every single one of us in here, when it comes to standing before a holy God, isn't every act of welcoming into the family of God just an act of amazing, unmerited, unconditional grace on God's part? Saul is an extreme example, but every Welcoming into the family of God is an amazing act of grace. Yours is, mine is, Saul's certainly is. And then beyond that, I want to ask you to consider even harder still, don't you see that God's call to Ananias, as unimaginable as it is, is the same call that he puts on you and I this morning? We are all called to be those who are Greeters, who are welcoming those that God is calling him to himself into the family of God. Whoever they are and wherever they've come from, as he brings them to himself, we are called to be those, just like Ananias, who come and pray and welcome, not probationary members, but full members into God's family. We have the same call as Ananias. Think of the people that we've looked at in this series. Jacob, uh, a liar. King David, an adulterer. Nebuchadnezzar, proud king. Peter, coward. And now Saul, a murderer. Just, Just picture that list. Picture those men in your head and then just imagine them now. Sprinkled throughout our congregation. Sitting around. They're part of the family. And it's hard for us to imagine, and yet this is the picture of what God shows us in his word of what his family really looks like. This is what it really looks like. It's not that other thing. It's this. It's a true family portrait. No, not of people who, who stay in those places of brokenness, but certainly people who've come from them. And as gently and yet as emphatically and forcefully as I can say to you this morning, hear me say this right now. You don't actually need to imagine what it's like to have those guys sitting in the church with you. You're doing it right now. <laughs> if you look around you right now, you, you, you are sitting with those people. Each one of us is a story just like this in one degree or another. And God has called us into this family And he's called us not to be uh, uh, gatekeepers and bouncers, but to be welcomers and greeters into it now, to the rest that he's calling to himself. Sally, congratulations. You've got a a bigger team of greeters now for the welcome team. Who are the people that God is calling and goading towards himself right now that you feel are beyond his reach? The people that you wouldn't even want him to reach. 
Who's that person that you stopped praying for because you feel like they're just too far, they're too resistant, they're too hostile to the message of the gospel? Every time you think of that, every time you feel like they're too far, remember these people that we've looked at in our passage. Remember Jacob, David, Nebuchadnezzar, Peter, and Saul. Those are the kind of people that God calls to himself all the time. And as the Saul who turned Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and such were some of you. Maybe you weren't as far gone as some of those guys were. Or maybe you're even further gone. The point to remember is that wherever your starting point is, the ground around the foot of the cross is absolutely level. Nobody stands on a higher mound. When we come to Jesus, we all start at the same level. And as one pastor said so well, nobody, nobody comes to the cross and stands there leaning against it just saying, hey, I did it, why can't you? All of us come to the cross bowing in humble amazement that God would save us and we call to others, come on, there's, there's room here for you. There's room here for you. 1 John 3, 1. We read these amazing words. See or behold what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. When you look around at this motley bunch of misfits and outlaws, this true family portrait of brothers and sisters, you know your own contribution to it. We know that that says nothing about our worthiness and everything about the amazing, unconditional love of God the love of our Father to welcome sinners like you and me to be partakers of his family, to be adopted sons and daughters into his family. We would rightly fear his rejection. We would rightly fear his condemnation because we know we're unworthy. But because of what Jesus did on our behalf, because he came, took on flesh, lived the perfect life we could never live, died the death that we should have died, and then was raised again. Because he did that, he absorbed all of our unworthiness and gave us his worthiness now. So now we hear only these words, Fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to welcome you and to give you the kingdom.